So when I came up with the idea for this talk, um, achieving privacy on Bitcoin was, I think, a little easier than it is today, unfortunately. Um, but nevertheless, many of the principles still apply, and I think they are uh, more important today than they have ever been for people to understand what these principles are and how you can transact privately, or at least how you can be more private. So let's start with some of those principles. First of all, we need to understand that Bitcoin is an open and transparent ledger, and that ledger is comprised of atomic units called transactions. And those transactions, in order to understand how they work, you need to understand the UTXO model. Now, the UTXO model is one where we basically have, as we see here, a variety of inputs, and they are completely consumed in the transaction to create some outputs. And then what we can do is we can use these outputs as further inputs in more transactions. So we can then, if I was to spend the change output, I would then have another transaction which would then create a transaction graph like you see here. So it's really important to internalize what is actually going on with the UTXO model. Now, the second principle we need to consider is that Bitcoin is a pseudonymous system. So that means that any useful analysis on Bitcoin must start with tying a real-world identity to the otherwise arbitrary letters and numbers that make up an address. So it's very important that that, that link needs to be made in order for us to be able to do anything. So that's the second principle we need to consider. Now, if we want to consider, well, what is blockchain analysis doing? Well, it's starting with these real-world identities. It's following the flow of funds through the network. And as we'll see when looked at from another way, it's actually just trying to determine where does the change of ownership take place. So if we were trying to do this work, um, and it's important for us to put our, ourselves in the, in the heads of the people trying to do this work, um, what we want to do is start off with some common uh, assumptions, if you will. And the first of these, the most common of these, is known as the common input ownership heuristic very well known, and all this means is that we assume, and unfortunately this is true for the vast majority of ordinary transactions on the blockchain, we assume that all of the inputs are owned by the same person, the same entity, right? So as you can see, we've got those two green dots, dots there in our transaction graph. And then what we can further do is we can assume or we can try and determine which is the change output and which is the payment out output. And if we can accurately determine that, we can then go ahead and further determine how these funds flow through the graph. As we can see here, we can put a circle around all of these green dots. Now, when you look at that from the other perspective, actually what we are determining is where the change of ownership takes place, as you can see by the differently colored dots. So that's actually what blockchain analysis is doing, is determining change of ownership. And that's an important way to think about it. But we all know what they say about assumptions, right? So what if we were to get this wrong? What if, in fact, we were to assume incorrectly that the payment was, in fact, that looked like, like this? And what I'm trying to indicate with this is that all blockchain analysis is is really probabilities, because we have to assume, assume things. And so privacy, then, is trying to reduce the probability of being able to follow the flow of funds through this transaction graph. That is what we are often trying to do with the privacy techniques that we have. OK, so having looked, looked at a few of those, those things, let's look at some of the common pitfalls that we might have. We've all heard about address reuse. So if you send funds to the same address, you've got 100% certainty that they are controlled by the same entity, right? So that's something you always want to avoid doing. Then, due to Bitcoin's history, we have a variety of different address types, and these address types can help us identify, for example, which is the change output, because if it stands out in the transaction, then it is more likely that the change, that the, um, the payment is, in fact, the different address, address type. And then finally, some, something which is really simple, but I see all the time, is that simply using round numbers when we send a payment amount can really identify which is the payment, because if the change is not a round number, then it is far more likely that the change output can be found out and can be correctly identified. So that's just some of, some of the things. And Sparrow will warn you about a few, a few of these. So having gone through a few of these common pit, pitfalls, let's have a look at some privacy techniques that we can actually use in order to uh, transact more pri private, privately. <coughs> 
The, first of all, I just want to do a bit of a setup so we, we can understand how we are thinking about them. First of all, we have the idea of steganographic te te techniques versus those that are not. And what this word means is transactions that are obvious on-chain, that we've used some kind of privacy technique versus those that are not. And the difference between the two of these is that steganographic techniques improve the privacy of everyone on-chain, whereas non steganographic improves the privacy of those who are using that particular technique. Right, so there's an interesting difference between the two, and it's always useful to consider, consider that. Secondly, what is the anonymity set that we are getting with the particular technique uh, that we are using? Because it's very important if we are trying to essentially be part of a cloud of transactions, how large is that cloud? Then we need to consider who are we getting privacy from. We might be getting privacy from the world, in general, but we might not be getting privacy from the particular provider that's actually enabling us to create this particular process. And finally, what kind of cluster of addresses are we ending up in by using this te technique? So having said all of that, let's go on to a few te techniques and I'll discuss very briefly uh, how they work and a few thoughts about them. And I'm going to start off with the equal output coin, coin join, which is probably the most effective that we know of. Um, it, is, uh, it is unfortunately at this time a somewhat controversial technique as well. Um, but as we can see, it's a very simple uh, kind of transaction. What we have here are multiple parties that are coming in with more or less the same value inputs and are creating outputs of the same val 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 value, and that's of course what the artwork on the back is also showing. So I like to think of this as a form of encryption. If you have a text message and you encrypt that text message, somebody on the outside sees encryption, right? They can't read what the text message is. And that's very similar if you string a few of these together, for example, you very quickly end up in the same space, but just for financial transactions. So it's a very powerful technique because we can't tell, of course, we could switch around these dots and it wouldn't make any difference, right? So uh, one of the difficulties with this particular approach is the amount of coordination required in order to achieve it, right? Not only do we have to have people who are contributing more or less the same input value, but also we have to coordinate them to be able to create a transaction like, like this. So what if we were to simplify this and bring it down to two people, for example, and we also relax the input requirements by having change outputs here. But again, you can see how we have two payment amounts and, again, and it's quite difficult for us to, or for someone on the outside, I should say, to be able to determine which is the payment and which is the fake payment. So again, we are lowering the probabilities of being able to follow this flow of funds through the transaction graph. But again, we have the problem here of being able to, of needing to coordinate two people in order to create a transaction like, like this. So what if we were to simplify things still further? And here we have basically the same transaction, but now we just have one person, right, who creates this. And on chain, it looks exactly the same like the two person that we just had, but now we have a fake two person coin join. Again, more difficult to determine which is the real payment and which is the fake. And Sparrow will create this kind of transaction for you if you click the privacy button at the bottom. So uh, useful to know and useful to use these kind of approaches uh, in order to reduce the probabilities, as I said before. Then let's have a look at a pay join. So a pay join, very interesting technique. Say I was paying a merchant and that merchant agreed to contribute an input to the transaction that I was making. Uh, this has not only the impact of breaking the common input ownership heuristic that I mentioned earlier, but also it obfuscates the payment amount because of course that must now necessarily increase by the amount that the merchant has added. So it's quite a useful technique. Unfortunately, the incentives of this, without getting into the details, mean that it hasn't been a technique that has been greatly adopt adopted yet. The merchant has to run a hot, hot wallet and certain things. But we are now seeing development of a version two of PayJoin, and hopefully that will lend, lead to greater use of this, because if we can 
break the common ownership input heuristic on a more general level, then we will end up in a situation where Bitcoin is a lot more private by default. All right, I'm going to move on to coin swaps. Coin swaps are effectively where we swap out from one layer into another. And this is very helpful in order to be able to determine, you know, to essentially swap our coin history out with someone else's. Unfortunately, the downside is we must trust a provider who provides this for, for us. So it's got its disadvantages as well and not actually one of my favorite te techniques. But ne nevertheless, it does exist. Then what about receiving funds? Well, we have the idea of being able to receive funds. In, if we run a server, we can run, for example, BDC Pay Server, and it can send us addresses. Um, but of course, running a server has its downsides. We now have to put a server up there, run it, and also potentially have an IP address, which is not particularly private. So we have these non-interactive techniques, like BIP47 and silent payments, the downside of those is they need to be understood and the wallets need to support them. So it can restrict the amount of funds that you can receive, but useful to know anyway. I'm going to mention Lightning very briefly. Lightning is a complex protocol. Privacy on Lightning is complex as well. But we can say some general things. It is gradually getting better over time. Sending is a lot more private than receiving. And I think that the um, example offered by LSPs, for example, the Phoenix wallet, where you get to essentially hide in the cloud of transactions that are created by their node, is an interesting model and worth thinking about. Just some final thoughts. Um, always consider that every on-chain transaction you make is on the chain forever, and it will always be seen. So think ahead of what you're doing. Uh, I like to have multiple wallets, and I like to consider every transaction that I make. Always consider when adopting a new privacy technique, what is the anonymity set that I'm getting? Because it's if a new technique or a new implementation of a technique, you might want to think twice, because the anonymity set that you're getting may not be as great as you would want. And then finally, as I said at the start, all blockchain analysis must start with tying real-world identities to addresses. So every time we can avoid putting our real-world identities into databases that can identify us, we can transact more privately on-chain. Thank you.